Have you ever felt that everyone in the church seems to know something that you don't? They throw around terminology that just sounds so normal to them, the church ease, the Christian ease, you know, grace, faith, the Holy Spirit, redeemed, uh, the wrath of God, the curse, uh, the ransom. There's terms that they are biblical terms, but that doesn't mean just because we came to Christ, we know them. And that's part of what discipleship was intended to be in the church, but that seems to be lost for many people. So there's a lot of illiterate Christians that just nod their head along and say, mm, yeah, yeah, I agree, but don't actually understand it. There's a reason why it is critical and important to actually know what these terms are, because it's sort of like having a car and not understanding that the key goes into the ignition, you turn it, and you put your foot on the gas. That's what these terms can be for us is the activation of the truth in our life. And so if that's you and you just want to go deeper with the truths, you want to understand what some of these things are, we're going to be covering some of the most important truths in this upcoming 12 weeks. And today we're going to give you just sort of a starter package of why this is so important. Biblical terminology. The enemy seems to be just as interested in the words that are in the Bible as God is. And so as a believer, this is a battleground. I want you to talk to that and help us sort of unpack this idea of the words, the key words, the key ideas in scripture and why we need to fight for them and correctly understand them. Well, we are a lover of words. And I think even in, in scripture, in Christendom, we have a lot of favorite terms. Uh, I heard it once said, I don't know who said it, but the moment a fetus becomes, or a baby becomes a fetus, you can kill it. Uh, the moment a person becomes not a person, you have the Holocaust. And it's interesting that the enemy is always going after terms. If he can dumb down language, if he can skew it, if he can twist it, if he can reinterpret it, then actually we get the garbly gook of modern Christendom. Mm. And so one of the things we have a passion for is, okay, how do we bring back truth to the vocabulary of, of, of the believer? And that's kind of our heart and passion in this in this new series that we're diving into. Yeah, because words are the essence, I mean, not just of a word lover, but they're the essence of a strong Christian. Because if you don't understand the terminology in scripture, and there's classic illustrations of this, you know, where someone comes up to you and says, hey, brother, I'm so, so glad that you're getting sanctified and someone else is like what is what does that mean it sounds like you know hey someone that sounds offensive uh, to me if you don't know what these words mean you don't understand them you know hey you're saved by grace through faith and someone's like i don't understand what grace is don't know what faith is so how in the world can i be saved and so the terminology itself becomes a territory that the enemy is very interested in and i have noticed in so many of the students that come into this environment for training is they actually don't know the definition or the biblical definition of some of the most basic concepts in scripture, which leads us to this discussion. That's right. Well, it's almost like we have <clears throat> the special church vocabulary. It's like if you go to Starbucks, not that I should even bring this as an illustration up, but when you go to Starbucks, oh. uh, I, should, I should do it that way because <laughs> I don't go there anymore. Uh, I, I've been once in the last two weeks. <laughs> okay. So when you went to Starbucks, uh, Star it's interesting. Starbucks has its own language. Yeah. It has a culture. Yeah. And you are seen as cool if, if you can use that oh, vocabulary. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, know, you can whip out the hot oh, chai yeah. with 20 pumps or whatever it is that yeah. you get. Uh, yeah. Could I have uh, a tall uh, caramel macchiato? <laughs> <laughs> I think we do the same thing in the church where we throw out these terms all the time, presuming we actually know them, when we may have a semblance or a concept, but we're not actually living these things out. Mm -hmm. It is interesting, even if you go back to the very beginning, how the enemy loves to distort. It brings up questions and doubt. Um, and I'll just read Genesis 3, 1, but here's Adam and Eve in the garden and the serpent, which is more crafty than any beast of the field, uh, which God had made. He said to the woman, indeed, has God not said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. And isn't it interesting? There is a twist immediately mm -hmm. at the beginning mm -hmm. where, where the enemy is questioning scripture. He's questioning God's word. He's, he's bringing an affront mm -hmm. to truth. That's actually very dangerous mm -hmm. when it comes to the words of God. Well, what's happening in, in Genesis 3.1 is we see the first commission, the first word, as we would understand the word of God given to man, given to Adam, and it is very clear, do not eat from this tree. I mean, it's, 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 not, it's an unequivocal, clear statement. And the enemy immediately wants to call it into question, 
But that isn't just for Adam. All those that come out of Adam, which includes Eve, which is who this is spoken to, which includes us. And so our understanding even biblically is that in a strange sense, all of us are in Adam. And so we're all sort of receiving the same commission and the enemy is doing the same thing all throughout human history. He is trying to question and to ply a concern or a thought of doubt towards the clear word of God. And if he can do that, if he can distort or pervert us from the actual word, he's got us. There's something about the dilution of it. There's something about the swaying off. Like as some people have said, if you're on a journey and you get off by one degree, you're not just off by one step or one mile. If you go a long distance, you're off by a lot. And the enemy is interested in getting us off by degrees away from clear truth into the wilderness territory. Because you fleshed that out a little bit before as we were talking, we were talking about this idea that the enemy loves to pervert. He loves to, uh, Jesus said in John 10, 10, right? He, he loves to still kill, destroy. There's, there's always a twist in his nature. Mm -hmm. Would you just talk through just even that idea of how he perverts everything? Like mm -hmm. in other words, he can't actually create, mm -hmm. but, he, but he perverts. Could yeah. you just kind of like even flesh I think that a out? lot of people view human sexuality as like a devilish territory. And that's a classic illustration, probably the best illustration that is out there, that even Christians that know the word of God still feel a little sheepish and awkward. I mean, I, you and I actually both have talked, not, I don't wanna say freely, but we talk often on the topic of sexuality because of its importance and because of its lack of clarity in the church, it becomes very, very significant that we are clear on it. But it's very hard for some people where it's just like, are we supposed to be talking about this? This is church. And they forget that God created us this way. And our sexuality is not a result of the fall. We were created good. And it was very good, in fact, I think is the direct quote from scripture. And so God was pleased with what he had created and that included our sexuality, included our appetites. The fact that the enemy has come in to pervert does not mean God's original intent is not still stable in there. And that is what the enemy is always trying to do. So you take any of the key truths, like one of the, some of the ones we oftentimes will even start out Ellerslie with is we're gonna start out with faith, just the word faith. And it's funny because if I just went out to the average Christian and said, define faith for me. Uh, well, you know, it's <laughs> like, uh, it's a hard word to define. And that's very purposeful on the enemy's part. In other words, he wants it to be obscured. Grace, that's another key word. And it, it's ironic how important these words are because right. that isn't a, a lackluster player in the scriptures. That is a massive part of the new covenant operation. The Holy Spirit. <gasps> We don't talk about the Holy Spirit. I have a friend out in Michigan who says, my church, all growing up, they wouldn't even mention the Holy Spirit. They would say, uh, the Trinity is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Bible. <laughs> <laughs> and that is a paranoia that I think is very common right. in the world, but that's the enemy's game. He doesn't even want us addressing these issues, which allows nonsense to play out where there is no guard of scripture. If, if the conservative environment is not addressing these clearly and biblically, then the non-conservative environments are going to have playtime with them. And the other one could be love. For instance, the world has a definition, but it's not the biblical one. And so when we don't understand these, we, we, we call these hostages. These are territories or words that the enemy has claimed as his own. It's like, oh, no, that's mine. And many of us actually sort of feel like it is, like sexuality. Oh, that's the enemy's territory. Well, no, that's God's territory that the enemy is attempting to masquerade as the master of and to say, I have the best version of this. If you want to be satisfied sexually, then you come to me, says the enemy. And I would say the exact opposite is true. God is the inventor and the creator of it. He's the one that designed us this way. And if we heed him, we actually find the fulfillment and the fullest measure of what we were intended for. Talk about the opposite message. And yet that is true in all of these elements, not just sexuality. That's every one of the things I could bring up is like the enemy's distortion destroys. God's truth establishes and set free, sets free. And I love that about the word of God, how the moment you actually come under the authority of scripture and begin to actually see what God is saying and how he is defining terms, it, it, it does actually release you to go, oh, I can actually hold tight to this truth and it actually can change my life. I can actually begin to practically live by grace. I can practically live by faith. 
I can practically be filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people will come to us and just be like, so how does the Christian life practically work? Mm -hmm. And one of the key things that is so important is, well, let's establish terms. Yeah. Because what you say as a term, I, I just had a conversation this last couple of days with this young guy, and he's just like, I had this thing, and, and I said, hold, hold on, define that. Because it is amazing how I will interpret a word and I presume you have that understanding, yeah. when actually we're talking about two totally different things. Mm -hmm. Could we just use one as uh, just one example? Uh, we have a whole list. Um, we only have space for 12 in this series. I think we have a list of now like 20. Uh, that, that we <laughs> and were that's like, our cut down list because it's like, well, yeah, well. Because <laughs> I was like, oh, uh, yes, the, the enemy loves just meddling in, in this vocabulary. But just one of the terms I think would be fun just to show an example of um, is actually probably a term that causes a lot of trepidation for a lot of mm -hmm. people, which is the term father. Mm -hmm. Because I think in the modern day, the moment we hear that God is a father or even as a good father, mm -hmm we immediately associate that with an earthly mm -hmm. person, right? An earthly parent. Yeah. And there is no perfect earthly parent mm -hmm. there. And, and we've been hurt and there's been all this difficulty. And we just presume that because that's what our earthly parents like, that must be what God is like. Mm -hmm. Could you, could you even just walk us through this idea of why is this term father so important? And how do we redeem this term in our minds? Jesus, when referring to the father, but God, is going to exclusively use the term father. That is not on accident. In other words, the chief revelation of God is Jesus. And Jesus, when communicating about who he is revealing as God here in the flesh, is going to use a term. So this isn't a low level term like one of 40. And we're just, you know, you and I just are like, hey, let's make that the top one. I would say Jesus himself is clearly articulating that he is the revelation of the father. Right? So this is not a small thing. So what the enemy wants to do is diminish this. He doesn't want us to grasp this because if we see God as Jesus came to reveal him, oh no, that could set us free. Oh no, I could lose a captive. Oh no, I mean, you could go on the whole list. The enemy has a lot to panic about. The gospel is not good news to him. It's bad news to him. And so the enemy wants to distort our connection points with this. We innately crave a father. The first word, ironically, in the entire Hebrew language, which is the basis of the entire Old Testament, is ab, which means father, which is amazing to think that the entire language that's going to start the scriptures, that the re revelation of God is going to begin in, the entire nature and the purpose of God is going to be revealed in, the very first word in it is ab. And ironically, in the New Testament, we are when we're, when we're changed by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit enters into us that we cry out, Abba, Father. The first words of the new birth are the same as the first words of the Hebrew language, which is Father. So I would say, yeah, we're not talking about a small thing here, which is why the enemy hits it hard. The enemy is not an idiot. He has limited resource, you know, even though he wants to make us think that he is unlimited. He has one third the angelic host. Do you know what that means mathematically? That means God has double the angelic host and he's God. So if you're going to just vote on paper on who's going to win this thing, you'd go with God. But the enemy is a loudmouth, and he wants to masquerade as if he's bigger than he is. So what he needs to do is take his limited resource and place it where it has most, the most bang for the buck. And in the issue of fatherhood, there's a lot of bang for that buck. And so he wants to go after that. And if he can distort a child's understanding of an earthly father, then he has succeeded in hindering our understanding of God as a heavenly father. It's a great tactic, great strategy. You could give an applause to the enemy for how wise and how smart he is. But I don't want to do that. You know, we don't want to give him any kudos for it because he's actually trying to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's so good. <clears throat> when we come to scripture, then say, say we take the issue of Ob, right, the mm -hmm. Father. We, as believers, we need to hit a reset button, and that's mm -hmm. true about all these terms. Yep. I think e even if we have a good definition, I think just a good proper posture of our soul is, okay, God from scripture would you reveal truth to me? Mm -hmm. Would you would you show me what faith is? Would you show me what grace is? And we're going to be talking about those in upcoming episodes. But like, Lord, show me what the Holy Spirit, who is he? What does he actually do? How do we hit reset on Father? Because I think for a lot of us, there's so much pain associated. There's so much, uh, whether it's abuse, verbal, whether it's abandonment, mm -hmm. whether like we have all this heartache and trauma uh, with this term. 
how, how do we hit reset biblically with the term father so yeah. that we can actually understand that our God is a good, mm-hmm. good father? Well, it says that truth sets free. And that's a function of truth. It is actually, it, this, these are hard issues. Like I, I would say, ironically, almost every one of these words that we're going to be bringing up has been a hard thing for me where I've had to go through a reset. The one that I probably haven't had to do is father because I had such a good father experience in my life, which is just sort of an irony that it's sort of hard for anyone to believe me. It's like, oh yeah, well, how easy is it for these words all came to you naturally. Every single one of them, like next week when we talk about the Holy Spirit, whoa, I got a lot of baggage there. And so you could say, Eric, how did you get past that? Well, first of all, I need to come to the conclusion that my thinking is incorrect. And I have a lot, you have a lot of emotion with that thinking. There's a lot of damage that the enemy has tried to build up, a lot of scar tissue. But you need to address that from a heavenly perspective. It's like, okay, that wasn't God creating that scar tissue. That was actually an earthly system that was unhealthy. That was the enemy lying to me. All right, call a spade a spade. That was a lie. And then you need to apply truth and you need to believe the truth. And that's why believing is truly the transfer out of darkness into light because you choose to say, okay, even though I haven't felt this and even though I haven't experienced this yet, like in a father, I imagine that the situation was I had a really rough earthly situation with a father that was abusive, that was angry, that was harsh, that was everything that is difficult to grow up with, right? He ignored me. I mean, you could make the list rather long, but that isn't God. And so God, I've felt like that's you, but feelings aren't what lead us. Facts are what lead us and it's the truth. And so we choose to believe the truth, even though our experience with an earthly father has been unhealthy we can actually swap that out for the truth. And so it's a repentance of actually believing something that was not true and tagging God with a falsehood. It's like, God, I I sense that you're abusive to me. And he's looking back at us going, well, no. And yet we still held that against him. Well, that's something we need to make right. So we say, Lord, that was wrong. Please forgive me. I turn from that and I choose to agree with the truth on this matter. And so if we were going to unpack the, you know, what we teach at Ellie's, which is fact, faith, and experience, you know, three characters are walking a ridge pole of a barn. And, you know, it's an impossible ridge pole to walk, right? But the first character, fact, gets up there and just walks it. And we're like, well, I thought this was impossible. Yeah, but it's fact. It's like Jesus. It's the truth, right? And so he can walk the ridge pole. But a fact means that is which is without exaggeration. Faith follows fact. And when faith fixes its gaze on that fact as it walks the ridge pole of the roof, faith is able to gain, gain balance and pull off the impossible. And you could say, uh, I thought you said this was impossible. Now your first two characters have pulled it off. Yeah. They do, if, they, if faith follows the fact, it will live an impossible life, but there's a third character that really can weigh the whole situation down, and that's called experience. Experience is a loud mouth that's always clawing at the shirt sleeve of faith saying, hey, you need to consider me. And when we consider experience above the facts, above the truth, that's what leads to our downfall, and that's the enemy's game. Postmodernism is all experience related. So it's like, well, how do you feel about that? Have you ever experienced that? Have you ever seen a mountain picked up and thrown into the midst of the sea? Have you ever seen a man who overcame lust? Oh, you haven't seen it? Well, I guess it's not true then. That is a misnomer from the beginning, yet our entire culture is swallowed up in such a notion, whereas the truth is what sets you free. You could tell I'm a little passionate about this, (laughs) that we must forsake the experience and even turn our back on the experience and say, I don't understand this experience, but I do know what God says. And when you focus on the facts instead of the experience or the feelings, faith begins to walk the ridgepole, pulls off the impossible, and guess what happens to the experience? If you ignore it and you don't let it lead you, it will gain balance and actually come into alignment with faith as it follows fact. That's so good. I think in this specific arena, in, in light of that, one of the things I just noticed is that the more that I read and study scripture and the more I actually begin to know God's character the more I actually rest in his fatherness. I don't know if that's an actual term, but in the fact that he is a good father, or if it may even take a different approach, if Jesus is the revelation of the Godhead, right? If he's the physical expression of the invisible, then, well, how does the father think? Well, you look at Jesus. How does the father behave? Look at Jesus. How does the father talk? Look at Jesus. And I think I grew up with the idea that God, the father was in the Old Testament. God, the son came in the new, you know, that, that I, which is totally not right anyway. 
But it looks like God's a mean, nasty God in the Old Testament, stomping on people's heads, flick them into the abyss, right? Burn, baby, burn, right? And there's, and there's all this destruction. And yet that's actually a misappropriation because what you see in the Old Testament is actually the same character, the heart, the that's love, right. the nature that Jesus had in the new. It's, it's the same God. He does not change. And so when I, when I think about God as a father, for, for me, it's actually refreshing to be, what does Jesus look like? Because that's actually the nature of the father. He yeah. is so good. The father sent his son. The father is so full of love that he actually gives us freedom from sin so that, mm-hmm. as 1 John 4, 9 says, we can actually live through mm-hmm. Christ. In other words, every benefit that we need, or as 2 Peter 1, 3 says, everything that we need for life and godliness is found in one place. It's that gift from the father, Jesus. Mm-hmm. And in other words, he's given us his, his life. And I think that is such a wonderful reminder because regardless of our earthly parentage, we have a father who can be a father to the fatherless. He can he can redeem and restore the faulty, abusive images or whatever we've had in the past. God wants to hit a reset. Mm-hmm. But again, we have to humbly come to the word and let, as, as you just said, allow the facts, the truth mm-hmm. to actually lead us, which means we have to have a posture of, of great humility and submission mm-hmm. to say, okay, I actually am, am wrong, mm-hmm. which is really hard for us to do in this culture. God is right, and I'm, I'm actually going to bend under the authority of Scripture. So I'm actually really excited about this series mm-hmm. because what, what we are endeavoring to do over these next 11 episodes is to just work through each of these terms and just say, okay, what is, what is wrong with our understanding of this term, and how does the Bible actually set us free mm-hmm. So we can actually begin to live out the reality of the Christian life as God intended it, mm-hmm. which, which I know this is a passion point for you, but that is so stinking exciting because <laughs> I am, I'm so sick and tired of just talking the talk in our culture. Yeah. Uh, I actually want to see people living the life. And if I don't understand what grace is, if I don't understand what faith is, if I don't understand the Holy Spirit, if I don't understand who the father is, then I, I'm actually going to be prohibited from living out the reality of the Christian life. So as you mentioned, we're going to dive into the Holy Spirit next week, but Eric, I'm so excited about this series. One of the things that I, I think would be a, a fun addition as far as an add-on statement to what you just said is one of the key things that I've learned in dealing with this father is that if I don't understand something, it's okay to ask. And I don't just mean going around to someone in your life and asking, asking him. Most of what I know, I've learned in the midst of a rather unsteady Christian system, right? And I didn't always learn it. In fact, I probably learned far less from the Christian system than I just learned from scripture in coming to God and saying, God, I don't understand this. I didn't truly understand grace. I didn't understand faith. I didn't understand the Holy Spirit. I didn't understand love. I mean, you could go across the board. I didn't understand holiness. I didn't understand righteousness. I didn't understand sanctification. Oh, I heard definitions, but I didn't get it. And I I didn't, I couldn't quite see straight in any of these issues, but I came to God just like it says in James, and I asked for wisdom. Every single time, this is a testimony from Eric Ludy. every single time God has answered my questions. I've, I've, I've approached some of the hardest scriptures in the Bible and said, God, I don't know what to do with this, but could you instruct me? And he does. And there's such a compatibility of all the scriptures together. They all go together. There isn't like this, oh, well, yeah, you don't understand that scripture. That's because it's the weird scripture. And, you know, God, I guess, must have made a mistake in throwing it in there. Every single thing is compatible. It all works together to reveal one. And so I want to encourage everyone that this father that we're talking about, and even as we're talking about freeing the hostages, it's not just that we're freeing words from their barnacles or their imprisonment. We're sort of also freeing those that are listening, as they begin to come into understanding of what these words actually mean, it is so good because they each reveal the good news and they reveal the character of God in a unique way. That's why the words are so powerful. They're the engine of the gospel. All these words that we're covering, they're, they're literally what make the gospel hum and roar in our life. So as we return to those, watch out world. There's gonna be hostages set free. That's so good. How about just the way to end this particular episode, why don't we just pray? And I'd love just to pray that God would actually give us a revelation of truth uh, in this series. What are we doing next week, by the way? Uh, uh, do yeah, we have that defined? Yeah, we're doing the Holy Spirit. So, Do you remember my title, my working title for that? Uh, yes, Terrified of Becoming a Wacko. 
uh, which <laughs> we may not use. Which it, we that will likely not use. But uh, that's why I wanted to get it out because sometimes my working <laughs> titles never make it. But I agree. I think we should pray and just ask that th this entire series would just be bathed in a grace because this is a new s way that we're even doing this. And I, I, I just want to see God work in and through this. I don't want to waste our time. I don't want to waste someone listening. I want this to be purposeful. I want it to have a sharpness to it. So let's do that. Who's praying? Is it you I'll or pray. me? Okay, let's do it. Uh, Jesus, we do thank you that that you are Father, or, or that you are a revelation of the Father. And Lord, we do pray that you would give a clarity of just these terminologies as we're walking through this series. Would you just give us a revelation uh, of wisdom, of truth, Lord, would you set us free from whatever the past experiences are, the, the clinging that we have with old terms? Lord, I pray that the, the word of God would come alive and that we would see truth as it is. Let us not just esteem uh, to, to the truth, but let us actually live out the reality of it. And so, Lord, we're just excited to see what you're going to do. I pray that you would uh, prepare Eric and I for uh, just the delivery, and I pray that you would even prepare those who are listening, uh, that we would actually be set free from the bondage uh, of some of this terminology that we could actually fully live as Christians in the days in which we live. We love you. and give you all the praise and the glory in your precious name. Amen. Amen.